Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm here today with Bradley Geddon of Synopsys, who's going to talk about different types of AI hardware. So Bradley, there are certainly some commonalities in AI hardware, but they're also pretty different too, right? So you have lots of Macs and you have lots of memory scattered around, but you also have differences because each one is trying to do something different. Yeah, no, that's right. It, you know, we, we looked a lot at, uh, you know, different architecture styles, um, you know, and there were definitely some commonalities that stuck out. And, you know, when it came down to it, we identified essentially at a high level, three different, more of the most popular um, hardware architecture styles in AI that is, is pretty prevalent. I mean, it's not, it doesn't cover the entire space, but certainly a large majority of the different AI hardware out there can be categorized into one of the three different uh, architectures that we, we identified. And that's really one of the big goals here, right, is you don't need a custom design for everything, completely custom, because it takes way too long, costs too much money, but you do, you do want to be able to uh, modify this for whatever application you're using it for. Exactly, exactly. And, you know, part of it was also, you know, to take a look at these hardware architectures and then identify, you know, is there any design methodology uh, or synthesis methodology that can apply uh, to these specific designs, if we could identify some uh, specific characteristics uh, in, in these architectures. So let's drill down into this. Absolutely, sure. So Bradley, what are we looking at here? Okay, and so, you know, like I mentioned, you know, we did an analysis and we came up with essentially three different styles of, of deep learning hardware. So why don't I talk you through a little bit what we identified and, uh, you know, of course you can stop me at any time to ask any questions. So probably one of the most popular is systolic arrays. Um, systolic arrays are, are not new for AI hardware. These were uh, developed in for uh, parallel computing, uh, doing sort of linear algebra uh, matrix calculations. So essentially this is a, a mesh of dedicated hardware units uh, for uh, doing calculations, matrix calculations in particular. So typically they are in AI hardware you know, uh, n, n by m, n by n arrays of uh, multiply accumulates. Typically well suited to doing each a portion of a high level AI algorithm. Where do you typically find this type of design? What market would this be headed into? So this is pr pretty much in either uh, edge application where they're doing uh, image recognition. Here, because uh, I mentioned the hardware is pretty dedicated, it, it is limited to the number of different uh, algorithms that it can execute. So, you know, in a very uh, dedicated application, like something like image recognition, uh, systolic arrays is very appropriate. What else do you have? Another um, very popular configuration is what's called a two-dimensional coarse-grained uh, reconfigurable array. So this, uh, as the name implies, is where instead of being uh, hardwired, it's made up of an array of processing elements that, that can be reconfigured. Either they're, they're tiny DSPs, uh, they have some memory, they have mesh interconnect registers, they're more applicable to where you may have different types of algorithms that you want to execute, uh, be able to reconfigure even on, on the fly um, and do any kind of hardware uh, calculation. So similar kind of concept of, of these mesh interconnects, but now uh, much more reconfigurable. Do you pay a penalty on something like a reconfigurable array because you have just basically that configuration as opposed to everything hardwired? Absolutely. So, you know, reconfiguration means you're going to have an area impact. You potentially could have performance impact because there's some redundancies in place. But uh, it's uh, obviously it's the price you pay for, for reconfiguration. I mean, pretty much similar to an FPGA and an ASIC, for instance. So what's the third style? So then it's, you know, something that's a little less common, but we still see quite a bit of it is kind of this parallel pipelining flow. So here, the, the goal is, is high speed and uh, high bandwidth calculations where it's kind of a waterfall, where data is coming in on the one end, it's being passed rapidly from each stage in the pipeline over, and then eventually a result is computed in, in the middle and, uh, and passed into memory, and a decision is made if it's uh, in an AI application, you know, is the image a dog, 
And so it's very, it, it's a very high speed. It's very parallel. So these are very, very big chips. And also, like I said, it's kind of waterfall. So they're, they're moving quickly from state, from stage to stage. So it's a, it's a little bit different, but we do see a few instances of this kind of architecture out there. The problem is that when you're working with any of these, what you really want to be able to do is take what you know in terms of being able to design these and be able to apply it across. So you're not just developing one, you're developing lots of these different things. You don't want to have to relearn all the tools, all the methodologies. How do you do that? Is it just the same tools? Do you have to uh, raise the level of abstraction? What are you trying to do here? So, you know, what we looked at at all of these designs, something that should probably spring out at you right away is the repetitive nature of all of these designs. They have small blocks that are repeated many, many times. So the question is, how do you take advantage of that repeatability and that multiple instantiations of the same block to accelerate the whole hardware design and implementation process? So the tools work, but what do you do in terms of your methodology? How does that begin to change? There's essentially two methodologies for synthesis. And, uh, you know, how do they apply? What are the pros and cons for array designs? So, you know, big question. Do we go flat or do we do hierarchical? So, you know, you look out there, flat, probably the, one of the biggest benefits of doing a, a flat synthesis is you can maximize your QOR, you can do uh, massive amounts of uh, boundary optimizations. The challenge you have here is you have extremely long run times. Any change to a block in the array, obviously is gonna require a complete full resynthesis. And it gets very complicated in terms of floor planning, uh, place and route, uh, here you're doing a flat, block, it's, it's very difficult to take advantage of, of that repeatability. What happens on the hierarchical side? So, you know, you look at hierarchical, and here you get, you know, you get good QOR. Do you get the absolute best? Maybe not, but then you have to ask yourself if that's what you need. It's a big trade-off. But on the plus side, the run times are much shorter. You only need to resynthesize any block that's, that's changed. You don't need to redo the entire design. And because of that repeatability and the arrayed nature of these designs, it's significantly simplifies the floor planning and the whole implementation PNR process. So is it definitely either or, or is there some sort of in between where you get the benefits of both, but not necessarily the absolute optimization of both? Yeah, no, that's a very really good question because in the arrays, for instance, you can take advantage of the hierarchical synthesis, which is what you know, I'm talking about here. But then you may have a processor on board uh, you know, be it any kind of core, and uh, you can take advantage of synthesizing that processor flat because then, you know, for that processor, you may be pushing for, the, you know, highest frequencies, lowest power as well. So you, it's definitely a mixed bag, but um, for in the instances where the part of the design is arrayed, this is where the hierarchical synthesis really shows out its benefits. So what's the next big challenge here and how do you approach it? Another good question, Ed. So, you know, how do you do, you know, full-featured hierarchical synthesis? You know, what, it's, it, it's, it's a lot more complicated than it sounds. You know, if you look in the market, uh, you know, Design Compiler NXT, you know, is, is probably the dominant synthesis tool in the market. So if we just look at how Design Compiler NXT approaches this problem. So, you know, if you have a massively arrayed design, you can't just black box those arrays. Because then when you get to the next level of hierarchy, uh, and you're doing around a synthesis, what does the synthesis tool see where the black boxes are? And it has to start making decisions. And if it has no information, uh, the results can, can be dramatically poorer in terms of QR. And that's been one of the problems in designing a lot of these AI machine learning type of chips is that you are dealing with a lot of black box technology the algorithms themselves behave in ways that you don't necessarily understand. You're trying to get as much visibility into this process now as possible, right? Exactly, exactly. That's very, very insightful. So, you know, with DC NXT, what's happening here is that Design Combined NXT will create what's called a block abstract model. And in this model, it takes account of the periphery of that array block. And so uh, DC can now understand the timing at the interface, the parasitics, uh, any other information it needs to produce a high quality synthesis result at the next level of hierarchy. So it's exactly as you said, bringing more visibility onto that next level of hierarchy. 
So given all of this, obviously people want to be able to develop a lot of these designs and they want to be able to, to use what they learn, but there's also some new stuff here. How much of a learning curve is there? How much familiarity is there with the methodologies, with the tools that they're using? You know, a lot of this is, is pretty standard, what users have been used to in the past. You know, adopting this methodology with the block abstract models, you know, there's a little bit of a learning curve, but it, it's nothing significant. And in fact, many customers have been using this functionality in array designs, you know, before AI was, was even somewhere where we, uh, customers were uh, investing. So yeah, very little effort to get up and running with this hierarchical synthesis flow. Brad, we get it, and thanks for a great explanation. Thank you so much, Ed, for your time.